at the end of the day, we're, we're looking for relative returns. So, you know, look at a hundred deals and whatever your model spits out, you know, you want to pick the, the couple best ones. Hello, and welcome to Pillars of Wealth Creation, where we talk about creating financial success with a special focus on business and real estate. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. Now, let's get to it. Hello, and welcome back to Pillars of Wealth Creation. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. With me, excited to have Rob Beardsley. Rob, Rob, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing excellent. A little bit about Rob. He oversees acquisitions and capital markets for Lone Star Capital and has acquired over $100 million of multifamily real estate. He's evaluated thousands of opportunities using proprietary underwriting models and published the number one book on multifamily underwriting, The Definitive Guide to Underwriting Multifamily Acquisitions. So with that said, Rob, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, man. Why don't you dive in a little bit more, talk to us about kind of your background. How did you get into to what you're doing? Where'd you start before that? Yeah, sure. So I started in, you know, looking at multifamily in, well, in college and my background, what, you know, I grew up in Northern California and Silicon Valley. So I had kind of a tech influence growing up, but also my, my parents, ran a residential brokerage firm uh, from home. So I got to really get a lot of exposure from, you know, the real estate transaction side and kind of the single family world uh, through them. And uh, so it all kind of came together. I was, as I was in college studying computer science, I was looking and kind of thinking about, okay, well, how do I actually make money? How do I produce, how do I invest my money? How do I produce cash flow and things like that? So it just really circled me back to, to real estate. And then, you know, because of my, uh, my family's background and single family, it really was a natural progression, but somewhat of a paradigm shift to look at multifamily, right? On the one hand, multifamily, it's kind of like this big commercial asset. And, you know, my parents, you know, only had done, you know, mostly brokerage on the single family side and, you know, some, some small flips, uh, smaller flips and stuff on the, on the single family side. So, you know, thinking about owning multi-million dollar property on the multifamily side and, and hundreds of units and rather than just one unit, you know, big, big changes, but because of that kind of foundation of understanding uh, single family, right. It's, it's, it's not a very difficult thing to, to transition to, or to at least wrap your uh, arms around, uh, you know, the business model. So, so that's where I, you know, what I latched onto is multifamily started uh, researching and networking and getting involved in the space. And, um, you know, definitely with the help of, of lots of people, my, my, my family met a business partner, mentors, you know, was able to kind of come together and put our first deal together. And that was a springboard to obviously building uh, new relationships, building up a reputation with the brokers, you know, to be able to see more deals and, you know, cascade that into uh, a growing portfolio and, and being able to actually, you know, own and operate property today. Were your your parents obviously in, in the real estate? That that was um, kind of a little natural fit. But as you said, single family, multifamily, some similarities, but quite a bit different. Especially when we're talking large multifamily, and you're, you're not buying duplexes, you're buying large multifamily. So difference was it? Do you think it was a was it a was it an influence? Was there some of that? Hey, what are you doing? Like, why don't you come on the single family side? Like, how did, how was that kind of conversation where you're like, Hey, I'm going to buy, I'm buying these big apartment buildings. Was it like, well, what are you doing? Maybe you should do some single. How, how did that conversation go? I think it was a, I mean, I was fortunate to kind of be a, all things considered a clean slate. You know, I didn't have any preconceived notions and I was too naive to really know or think that what I was doing was, was, was so difficult, which it was, mm. I mean, it was really hard and it is still really hard, but because I just kind of had that, uh, naiveness, I was willing to jump in feet first and kind of, uh, fig figure things out, learn as I go and whatnot. And, and, uh, you know, I, I think my parent, my parents have always been supportive of me. So it's not like they told me, Oh, you're crazy or this or that, uh, you know, conversely, when I did want to buy a single family property on my own, you know, they told me not to do it. And which, which is interesting. I mean, they just felt that it was not a good idea. 
uh, and that it would have been kind of like a distraction. It's a risk. So it's funny because paradoxically, and I'm sure you've, you've heard this and, and probably think this as well, in some cases, you know, owning one unit is more risk than owning a hundred units. Yeah. And so, you know, that in itself is a paradigm shift. So I think it, it's been, it's been a great journey. And also just going through the process, I've been able to, to, to bring my parents along with me and, uh, you know, show them this different business model. And, and they've been able to now have a new strategy uh, for their own pillars of wealth creation and be able to uh, invest their capital. That's cool. That's cool. Um, it, it's, I, I love that, that you said that owning a single family is, is really, it's more risky than a, a larger multifamily. So I, I love that you say that most people don't think that way. Uh, but cer- certainly would agree with you. So what's, um, wh- t- tell me about this book. You've got this, uh, you know, you've got this underwriting book, multifamily underwriting book. And tell, just, I guess, tell me what, what was the reason for writing the book and, and tell me a little bit more about it. Yeah. So, the book is a very straightforward how-to guide to to underwriting properties. So is it, is it our, a book or is it more like a, a manual, or is it a little bit of both? Yeah, I mean it's uh, I mean it's definitely both. So there's very much so a step-by-step process laid out in the book, right? And mm-hmm. and the way one of the ways I love to describe it is, you know, the first portion of the book, the a, a substantial portion of the book, is just utilizing my underwriting model itself as a table of contents to go through all the different inputs, assumptions, and outputs, and just kind of talk to those and explain them and, and give the rationale behind each one. And then, you know, the book also kind of builds on that, on that foundation with talking about partnership structures, sensitivity analyses, and kind of some of the, the things that are currently happening in the market. So the, the idea behind the book was when I, when I first started out, there was really no resource like it. There was no way to get a really concise, straightforward approach to actually uh, evaluating properties on a daily basis. You know, there's theory out there and maybe you could sign up for a, a multi-thousand dollar boot camp to get up to speed. Uh, but back when I was starting, there was no kind of straightforward book to just read and figure it out. And so that's what I wanted to, to create. I wanted to look at my process and, and put it on paper and share it with the world and not saying it's perfect, but you know, you get insight into the way that we look at property. And, and I think that's, uh, you know, super valuable and it's been great for, for people to, to see how, how we work and it lets them to kind of uh, get up to speed, but also they can then get insight into how we look at deals. And then maybe, uh, it, they could, you know, we, we've certainly learned from feedback from other investors and whatnot. Has there, so you wrote the book, you published it. And then after other people have read it, other people have given you feedback, you guys have underwritten more deals. You continue to obviously learn and uh, maybe, maybe things change. Has, have things changed? Do you do anything different now than, than when you wrote the book? I would say, uh, there's def- I'm sure there's some smaller things that we've definitely evolved. I would say the foundation is the same. Fundamentals but just as, have, have yeah, stayed true. Okay. Right. Fundamentals stayed true. But as an example, just through our experiences and 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 what we the way that we look at stuff now, we uh, you, you know our policies or our, our percentages for reserves have increased. You know, especially going through COVID and, and seeing that scenario unfold, it's always nice to have more cash on hand. So, you know, we used to, I think in the book, it says this, uh, I, I think in the book, w- the way that we approach it is if it's a stabilized deal financed with agency debt, then we would do, we would raise one month of expenses and debt service uh, as an, as a reserve. And okay. if it's a bridge loan, we would do one month of expenses and, or I'm sorry, we'd do two months of expenses and debt service, okay. right? So one to two months, depending on bridge or perm. And uh, nowadays I think we're looking more at like one and a half to maybe two and a half or even three in, in more extreme circumstances when there, you know, there's more business plan risk. So 
Yeah. So slightly increase the cash reserve. So yeah, I think we're always, we're always open to making small tweaks and certainly the model has changed, uh, you know, with different features and, uh, methodologies, but like you said, the foundation, uh, thankfully has been the foundation. Yep. Yep. What, you know, what are some important factors? Like what are, what are some things that everybody needs to really be aware of to be successful like maybe just just pick a couple obviously there's a there's a lot maybe pick a couple that you think are the the most important thing um that maybe people get hung up with or um you just think that if you're gonna do this and gonna do it right you, you need to you need to know this yes i would say you know when talking about actually modeling and looking at a potential acquisition and the business plan, I think people are typically over optimistic as to how fast they can go, how fast they can do the business plan. Right. Yeah. They think, Oh, year one, boom, stabilized rents up done, <laughs> but there's a lot that can happen. And so you know, we've experienced firsthand where you might have, uh, you know, issues on takeover, you're dealing with collections, you're dealing with uh, higher than anticipated vacancy and things like that. So that's of course why it's good to have more cash on hand and also just budget for, for that in your stabilization timeline and your initial takeover and whatnot. So I think, I think that's one thing, it, you know, you might, it, it's not the worst mistake in the world because in the end you might get to where you want it to go, but it just might take a little bit longer and you might actually have a little bit less cash flow than anticipated and whatnot. So, so long as you actually get there and, and make it, you know, it's not, not so, so bad to just have a, have a delay. But I think that's something that people often get a little ambitious on. Um, another thing would be just uh, making sure that the, the asset, the strategy, and the business plan all match and all of those match with your debt. Um, you know, if you're planning on doing a, a long term hold, you know, it's probably best if you do a, a long term agency loan. If you've got a really hairy, uh, reposition, you, know, you probably need a bridge loan and there's probably another option, but you want to be smart with that bridge loan and make sure that the leverage is right and make sure that the deals uh, projections actually are there to support the bridge loan and the bridge loan is not, uh, you know, too much risk for, for what you're, what you're getting. So I think that's, the, that's really important is, is on, you know, the debt side debt, in my opinion, makes up the greatest source of risk for these deals. So making sure that you get the debt right is hugely important. Do you look at other people's underwriting? Do you do you do you look at other sponsors' underwriting or ever see anybody else's? Uh, yeah, for sure. Are are those the two things that stick out to you? Or are there any other things that stick out to you when you're looking at somebody else's underwriting? Going, what? Wait a second here. I'm not so sure about this. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, for sure. Because so, I'm sure and- you look at other people's deals like that sometimes, right? Because I know yeah. I I look at some deals. I'm like, I, I don't know what I'm missing, but this thing doesn't make sense. No, I'm always looking at other stuff and just trying to figure out why is everything so expensive? What am I missing? Maybe everyone else <laughs> has the secret sauce and I'm just, you know, too way too conservative or I'm missing this extra juice. Uh, but what I would say is, and this is kind of smaller nitpicky stuff, but I would say, uh, and it's also just methodology, right? To each their own. But in, in our opinion, the way that we go about factoring in um, NOI and cap rate is, we include replacement reserves above the line, right? And a lot of people put those below the line, yep. um, which it's still a cash flow expense. So it's still they're still factoring it in into their cash flows, but they might not include it in their NOI, which inflates NOI, and then you have a it higher value. Yep. Exactly. So that's kind of a nitpicky thing, and not the end of the world. Or right? if I saw that and I was looking at something, I would just adjust it for myself, and boom, done, no big deal. Yep. But yeah, so you see that. Um, what's the other one? So this one is also kind of a sneaky one as well, which is using forward NOI to, to, to base your reversion value. And that's kind of a fancy way of saying, if you're planning on selling in year five, some people use year six NOI. So they'll grow NOI by some factor into year six, and then they'll use their exit cap rate and boom, now they've got a, you know, three to 5% higher sale price. And not a huge deal again, but it's just another way to kind of push and squeeze. Uh, so I, I look at those two things and kind of say, yeah, not, not for us, but it, I, I can see the arguments, but it's, I, I, and, and also 
the most important thing is consistency, right? If you do those things, do them every time. And that way you get consistent numbers, right? You don't want to look at one deal and it's a 12 IRR, another deal, it's 15 IRR. And, and you're trying to compare apples to oranges and whatnot. It, at the end of the day, we're, we're looking for relative returns. So, you know, look at a hundred deals and whatever your model spits out, you know, you want to pick the, the couple best ones. Hey, real quick, I want to talk to you about the North Star Real Estate Conference. We've got the North Star Real Estate Conference. It's a third annual. Of course, we're back live this year after taking a one-year hiatus and being virtual. We're live. We've got live and virtual options for you. So I'd love to see you there. North Star Real Estate Conference. It's all about cash flowing real estate. So we're going to be hitting on multifamily. We're going to be hitting on all things commercial. Uh, we'll be talking about syndications, asset management, all of that stuff that you're going to need to know and the mindset behind it. I've got a great lineup of speakers. So go on to northstarunlimited.live, buy your tickets now. Um, I want to see you there. I want to network with you. I want to shake your hand. I want to get to know you. And we've got a ton of people that are going to be there wanting to do the same thing. So join us, North Star Real Estate Conference, October 7th and 8th. Uh, and it is in the Twin Cities at Mystic Lake Casino. So I hope to see you there. The best one to me is when people will pick out the reversion cap rate and they're basing the reversion cap rate and for those of you who don't know, reversion cap rate just means the cap rate you're projecting to sell at later on down the road. So maybe that's five years down the road. You're saying, hey, you know, cap rates are at whatever, 5%. We're just going to assume they're going to, you know, be at five and a half percent in five years. So, so what I see a lot of people doing is the market might be a five cap, but they're buying at a four and a half cap. So the reversion cap rate is a five. And they're saying, investors, we're being conservative. We're buying at a four and a half cap. We're showing you we're selling at a five. But I'm going, wait a second, though. The market's a five right now. And, and, it, and I've even seen more than that. I've seen, hey, we're buying it at a four. We're selling at a four and a half. And I go, well, wait a second. Market's five. So you're saying cap rates are going to compress even farther. You're not being conservative. You're being super aggressive. Like, <laughs> have you yeah. seen that too? Oh, yeah. That's a huge yeah. one. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. So it's. Right. There's kind of that misconception of, well, we're, we're conservative because we're adding on 50 basis points to the exit to, to the current cap rate. But, you know, it doesn't matter what you paid for it, because especially when you're talking about value add, you might pay at a compressed cap rate for the value add opportunity. And then when when you're selling the property, you're no longer selling it as a value add. You're selling it as a stabilized property. Right. So you're selling two different properties. Uh, you know, when you buy, it's a value add when you sell it's stabilized so that they have different cap rates. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a great point for sure. Uh, you have to identify, you have to be in the market enough to know what the market cap rate is, irrespective of what you're paying for the property and then figure out whatever premium you want to add to that current market, right? Like you said, if the current market's five, maybe you want to add a quarter point, maybe you want to add a half a point, maybe you want to add a full point. Uh, you know, that's what, you know, that's up to you, but it should be based on the market and not your going in cap rate. Yeah, I agree. It needs to be based on the market. If you're in a very competitive, very tight, very nice growing market, it can definitely be uh, a, a little more aggressive and, and you don't need to probably do a, you know, add a, a whole point onto it. But if you're in a more of a slow market, tradition, traditionally is sold at higher cap rates and you're just compressed because of what's going on in the market today, you probably want to push that a little bit. So uh, you got to really look at what you're where you're at and even within the market, within the sub market, you know, um, C class, B class, A class, you know, all that you got to consider. Um, let's talk about your business and, and what you're doing, how you're growing it. So what, what are you guys, uh, focused on right now today? What kind of, what, what kind of properties, uh, value add, what kind of, what kind of things are you focused on? Yeah. So historically our favorite types of deals have been the, the heavier lift deals. So Ooh, I like, I like it. Love it. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, high vacancy, deferred maintenance, bad management, yeah. uh, low rents, all that kind of stuff. That's, that's what really gets us excited because I think those types of deals on the margin are, you know, potentially less understood or the, you know, that requires more analysis and, and due diligence. And, and that's where you can get superior results. Uh, so that's what we really like. 
You can also get success. stuck if you have no clue what you're doing. You can also, yeah, it's, just, it's, it's bottom line. You're taking more risk and yeah. risk is not always a bad thing, right? It gives right. you the opportunity to do something good, but it can also hurt you. Uh, so with that being said, there's been, you know, as you know, more and more competition yeah. and prices have gone up. And so the competition for those types of deals has increased to the point where it, in our opinion, for nine times out of 10, it doesn't make sense to pursue that deeper value add because of all the risks uh, baked in and the, and the high price. So what we've, uh, you know, it's not a complete pivot away from it. We still look at those deals where we, when we'd love to find one, but we've, we've been focusing on taking less risk, buying quality assets, buying durable, growing cash flows, and, uh, and then financing long-term, right? We've, we've, and before we were doing all our deals on bridge loans. Now we're you know, pretty hesitant to do bridge loans and we're really uh, preferring to do agents, 10 year agency debt. So that's how our strategy has changed. And uh, you know, we're really looking at buying deals uh, with, with great input. Like I said, great in place cash flow where we can get, if we can get 8% cash on cash in year one, you know, that's a great start for us to, to like the deal, right? We still need some value add. We need some upside to be able to get to, to closer to mid teens returns. But, uh, but that's kind of the foundation for us right now. Why not bridge loans? I've been talking with a lot of people lately and it seems like that's the flavor. Most people are saying I'm now only doing bridge loans. I've, I've heard that quite a bit from people as, as I used to never do bridge loans. Now that's the only thing I do. Why are you kind of the opposite? Why are you doing the opposite? Yeah, it's funny. It's a, uh, it's a funny market. I remember back in 2018 when rates were rising and everyone felt like a recession was coming. Everyone thought you, you were nuts if you were to do a bridge loan. And so I remember doing some bridge loans at that time and tons of investors were passing on our deals because we we're doing a bridge loan. It was just a sticking point. And, you know, everyone knows what happened late 2018 fed reverse course and started lowering rates and we didn't have a recession until COVID and uh, you know, those bridge loans have all went well. So, you know, while I do love the product and it can be great for the right deal, I, I think, you know, today we're seeing that overwhelming use of bridge loans because not because they're trying to, buy a transitional asset and optimize, you know, for that, they're just seeing it as a cheap source of debt. They're saying, oh, well, I can get way more leverage and the interest rates pretty similar, if not the same in certain cases. Yep. So that's why I think the flavor of the day is bridge. And you know, hopefully the market stays hot and no, nothing bad happens. But the problem is if, if we do have a, a recession or, or credit market tightens, you know, if you have a bridge loan and you haven't created enough value to be able to, to take out that bridge loan into a permanent loan, then you're stuck trying to go bridge to bridge in a tighter environment. And maybe you have to do a capital call because you're coming in with a new loan. That's a, a lower loan to value. So those are some of the risks with bridge loans that we see today, uh, which make us want to, you know, focus on the in place cash flow, uh, with agency debt. And the, the, you know, the last reason I'll add is, bridge loans aren't constrained based on in-place income, right? We can look at a property that produces very little cash, very little income, and we could still get a full leverage bridge loan, but you can't do that with agency. So that's uh, kind of how, how people are getting around these high prices today because lenders, uh, permanent lenders are doing a really good job of not getting too aggressive this cycle. It's they're sticking to their guns, sticking to their LTV, sticking to their DSCRs. And that's what's keeping leverage in check on the agency side, but on the bridge loan side, there's not really too much keeping it in check. There, you know, leverage is high over there, and um, and it's causing prices to go up, in my opinion. If we've seen quotes that are eighty um, percent purchase, hundred percent of renovation, and interest rate right around three percent on bridge loans. Just amazing, yeah, that's amazing crazy. terms. But like you said, it's great if things keep on going. It's not so great if you got to somehow get out of that thing because now you're leveraged really high and there's no room for you to get, get out and go anywhere except doing a capital call. Right. And so it, it's hard to turn, turn down cheap money. You know, 
money at 3% is great money to have. And so if you kind of have deep pockets of, of liquidity and so that if things are, were to go wrong, you know, you have the confidence, okay, I've got the money. I can just kind of fund the deal or, 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 or pay down the debt or whatever needs to be done. Uh, you know, that's, that's a good way to go. You might as well just borrow as much as you can at 3%. You know, you could figure out uh, the problem later. Uh, but if you're kind of got an individual partnership and it's strapped for cash, like you said, everything needs to go right to be able to take on that sort of leverage. Yeah. Yeah. So Rob, what's a, what's a mistake that you've made here? Um, and how have you learned from it? How can you teach our listeners uh, so they don't make that same mistake? So I, I would uh, go back to what I mentioned earlier about uh, taking over a property and, and thinking you can go faster. Um, I, you know, I brought that up because I see it a lot. And you know, we, we had a similar experience where you know, we thought that the property was a pretty you know, mid-80s occupancy. We would just have to kind of lease it up a little bit, do some renovations, and we hit our business plan. But you know, we actually we made the mistake of not realizing and having the experience of understanding that actually this is going to be a, a heavy reposition. The rent roll is going to need to be turned over. We're going to have to get all new tenants and that's going to take time. That's going to hurt our cash flow. Meanwhile, we're going to have to carry our bridge loan on an interest reserve and, uh, and it's a, it's a race against time. And so I think, and so I think that's the thing, right? Budgeting for takeover dip in occupancy, uh, turning over renovation spend, carrying the bridge loan, all that stuff needs to be factored in upfront and make sure that you have ample reserves to, to go through that initial process. So that way you can implement your business plan. And, and then of course, give enough time for that piece. So I think that is, uh, that's kind of going back to what I said earlier, but that's a mistake we made and, and have definitely learned from. Awesome. So when it comes to running a business successfully, you know, be able to build a portfolio like you've built and, and, grow a company, what are maybe three success tips, maybe habits, uh, things that you believe have been a big part, a crucial part of your success? Definitely being process driven. Uh, that's something that's, you know, a business is really just a, a collection of, 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 of human capital, financial capital, and you know, technological capital potentially. And it's just, it's all trying to get organized. And the more organized it is, the more efficient it is, effective it is. So having processes in place is one way to be more effective and uh, lets you actually scale and build the team. So, you know, when you start out, you're doing everything yourself. You're not really thinking about systems because it's like it's all in your head and you're the one doing it. But then eventually you have people who join your team and you know, you don't want to have to train them every single time, or if they leave, you have to train somebody brand new. And so having systems, and this is something that, uh, as I say this, I'm kind of thinking, oh, geez, we don't have this as dialed in as we should. Um, Cause a lot of stuff, we that just rely the on. The, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we just, re- <laughs> we rely on our wonderful team and, and everybody who's so smart and capable and can figure things out on the fly. But, you know, I'm always thinking about, okay, how do we turn this into a process? How do we, yeah. you know, just, just make this thing going? Cause it's all about, it's all about figuring out something that works and then just scaling it up and doing a lot of it. Yep. So I would say that's, uh, that's a big one for us. Awesome. Uh, anything else that you can think of? I would say similar, similarly, right. It's about scaling up. And so doing something, you know, figuring out that thing that works and then going out and getting the things you need to scale it. Right. So for, for you and I, our business, we need uh, capital to scale. We need deals to scale, and then we need people to help us execute on, on these things. And so uh, that's, those have been my focuses. And sometimes I'm focused on, okay, we need more deal flow. And so then I'm thinking about, okay, how do we uh, stay in touch with more brokers and how do we see more deals and what markets do we need to be in and things like that. And then other times I'll flip my focus completely on the capital side. Okay. How do we, uh, you know, attract new investors to our platform? How do we uh, nurture, the, you know, nurture those investors to build the trust and whatnot. And so mm-hmm. kind of picking different layers of the business and then drilling in and going deep and, 
and uh, building it out. Nice. Rob, how do you like to give back? I have always been a teacher. I've always enjoyed uh, teaching. You know, growing up, I, I taught piano. I was a math tutor and mm. things like that. So I, I'm always, I can't say I'm always, but I'm definitely willing to you know, share my time with people who reach out uh, and ask about, you know, their particular situation or advice or, you know, kind of mentorship like that. So it, it's fun to, it's fun to give back and, and see people actually win, you know, based on your advice and whatnot. I think that's, that's really rewarding. Yeah, definitely. That's awesome. And, and it's, man, it's so needed too. So that's awesome. Um, what's a favorite book that you can recommend to our listeners, business or real estate? I, uh, there's something that I read recently that I've, uh, was really enjoying. Oh, so that, yeah, no rules, rules. Hmm. I'm trying to remember what his name is. I think his last name is Reed or maybe his first name is Reed, but it's the CEO of Netflix, no rules, rules. And it's, it's an awesome management book, right? If you're, uh, running your own business or you're working in a business. Um, I think it's, it's such a cool insight into the way that Netflix operates as a business because they're very, you could say cutthroat, but they're very transparent. And if you're, if you're good, they're going to fire you, right? It's, you, you need to be great. And so they're looking for great people. They're, they're, they're shameless with firing, but when they fire you, they're gracious about it. They give you a big severance and all that good stuff, but they don't keep people for the sake of it. And they're very transparent, right? They expect from everybody, whether you're at the top or at the bottom to speak out and disagree. And even if, you know, disagree with the CEO, it doesn't matter that that's healthy and encouraged. And so I think that kind of stuff is critical. So, uh, and stuff that I'm aspiring to incorporate into our business as well. And I don't want anyone to feel like they can't speak up uh, for any reason. Man, that takes some courage to be willing to get rid of the good people in your right. company. Because you just think about it. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of bad people that end up, uh, you know, we, we own some assisted living. And so we have a lot of people that work for us. And uh, man, I can't imagine just keeping the it's, you know, you, you get nervous about it, but what it does, and we've noticed this with, the, with that side of the business is that as we get rid of the bad people, those, the other people are uplifted and they start doing a lot better where if you, as you, you think, oh, well, we need, I, we want to get rid of those people, but we just, we need to hire some more people before we can get rid of them. That's the wrong way to look at it because they're always dragging everybody down. And every time we fire somebody that's doing a bad job prior to us being ready to fire them, it always works out the best. So I think uh, that's a very interesting way to look at it and maybe something to aspire to. So yeah, definitely. <laughs> and I think Netflix, I'm have to read the book. Yeah, definitely check that book out. And, and Netflix obviously has the luxury of hiring top people and the type of, right. They're attract, attracting top talent. And then the work that they're requiring is, is very high level work. Right. Mm -hmm. So they, they are in a position to demand, you know, great work and, and rather than just a satisfactory job. So it's slightly different than assisted living, for example. Uh, I, so I could cut you some slack for sure, but it is cool to hear your uh, experiences with kind of uh, something similar. S similar, not quite, not quite that extreme, but all right, man. So last question for you. What are your three pillars of wealth creation? So I think uh, what I'll go with is number one, think long-term because that's really what, what wealth is. It's, it's a, at least the way I define wealth is I don't define it as a paycheck. I don't define it as an income. I think, I think of wealth as, you know, this, this long range, big, big thing and the, the basis of investing is foregoing the bird in the hand to hopefully get two in the bush. And that two in the bush is, is delayed gratification. And so, so thinking long-term is, you know, thinking of Warren Buffett, for example, there's a lot of risk. The, the shorter term that you look at an investment, the greater the risk, right? If you take any investment, no matter how risky it is, and start looking at it from a really long-term perspective, 
a lot of the risks decrease or go away. Yeah. So that's really cool. Like one way just to decrease your risk is just to, wait, to, to be really long-term. So that's, that's really cool. And I think I've seen it. And then you just look at the data, people who just invest in the market and don't touch it. And then years later, it's, it's doing so much better than everyone else who's tinkering and going in and out, in and out, in and out. So long-term number one. Um, number two is cash flow. Any wealth strategy has to have cash flow, right? Because if you don't have some sort of strategy for cash flow, it, it, you're, you're going to be put in a in, in a not good position. So, so yeah, and that's another way that I define wealth to begin with. I mean, I love the idea of having monthly checks coming from our real estate investments, right? And that that is one way that I define wealth. So I think you know, long term, plus the cash flow aspect, and then finally is tax strategy. Uh, because if you're giving away too much in taxes, that's just going to really clip your long-term compounding wealth factor. So being conscious of tax implications and optimizing your portfolio for that is just a great way to, to supercharge your returns. Awesome. Good stuff. Rob, look, I really appreciate you joining us. So uh, thanks a lot for that. And, and it, it was great. Learned a lot. And thanks for sharing with us, you know, about your book, um, uh, strategies of underwriting, uh, you know, the speed that you go, uh, thinking you can go too fast, uh, thinking that you can get your business plan done really quickly. Uh, it definitely will trip you up. Uh, also, not having those, the, the right reserves. Um, and making sure your strategy matches the debt. So uh, that was great. Um, and then, you know, your three pillars, thinking long-term, cash flow and the tax strategy. So all really good stuff. Appreciate you sharing uh, with us and you have a fantastic rest of the day. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks so much for listening. I appreciate you being a loyal listener. Say, I would love to have you go on to our Facebook page and subscribe. Uh, give us a thumbs up. Go on to iTunes or wherever you listen and give us a rating and review. Don't forget to subscribe. But your rating and review just helps us push this out to more and more people and continue to grow our audience and hopefully positively affect a ton of people out there that really need this and, and want this. So uh, the other thing I've got for you is a free ebook on my website. So go on to VentureDProperties.com, VentureDProperties.com and download our free ebook uh, on real estate and on syndication. And I've got some data points in there, some really good stuff for you. So I'd love to have you take a look at that. It's free. I'm not expecting anything from it. Uh, and, and also, look, if you want some help in multifamily, want some help learning, growing, getting your business off the ground, I would love to talk to you about what it would look like uh, to work with me potentially and see if that's a good fit. So you can go up to coachwithdex.com and check that out and uh, we can definitely have a, uh, a call. Thanks a lot for listening. You make it a fantastic rest of the day. I'll catch you on the next episode.